Hi everybody, Dr. Ellis here. In this short video, we're going to talk about how the process of bone remodeling works, and we're going to explore several ways that your body can manage this process of bone remodeling or change it. When we talk about bone remodeling, think of this a lot like remodeling that you can do on a house or on a building. So remodeling is a way of recycling or replacing your old bone tissue. And we're actually constantly remodeling our bones. A couple of fun facts for you. Every three years, all of the spongy bone in your body has been completely broken down and completely replaced. Notice that it takes about 10 years to do the exact same thing with compact bone. And this should give you an idea of how hard or easy it is to remodel these types of bone tissue. With it being so much faster, spongy bone is easier to remodel, compact bone a lot harder to remodel. The process of bone remodeling starts with osteoclasts. Remember that osteoclasts are my bone breakers. Osteoclasts break down bone tissue using things like acids or enzymes. Remember that when they spit out these acids and enzymes, the effect on my bone tissue is to release that calcium. That calcium that's been released can then be captured again by my osteoblasts. Remember, osteoblasts are my bone builders. They spit out proteins like collagen to make bones strong or those calcium binding proteins to catch the calcium from the bloodstream. So the process of bone remodeling starts with breaking bone and ultimately ends with reforming that bone. One of the ways that your body regulates this process of remodeling your bones is by using hormones. And when we talk about using hormones to regulate bone remodeling, it all comes down to your blood calcium levels. We're either going to break down bone tissue or build bone tissue, depending on what's going on with the level of calcium in your blood. Now notice that using hormones to regulate blood calcium is an example of what we call a negative feedback loop. When we talk about a negative feedback loop, what we're saying is if I have a stimulus, I have a change, I'm going to try to undo that change or do the opposite. So if my blood calcium gets too high, I'm going to try to drop it back down. If my blood calcium gets too low, I'm going to try to raise it. So in a negative feedback loop, we try to do the opposite of what we're detecting to get us back to normal. One set of hormones that we use to regulate blood calcium are parathyroid hormone and calcitonin, which we'll talk about in a moment. For, you, for, for parathyroid hormone, sometimes abbreviated PTH, parathyroid hormone, you need to know that this is released when I'm, my blood calcium levels are too low. There's not enough calcium in my bloodstream. The parathyroid glands detect this and they send out parathyroid hormone, PTH. Parathyroid hormone is made by the parathyroid glands. So that should be really easy for us to remember. And when we spit it out, one of the biggest uh, ways that it impacts our body is by increasing the activity of our osteoclasts. Remember that osteoclasts are my bone breakers. So as I activate those osteoclasts, they break down bone tissue, which releases calcium into the bloodstream. In AMP2, you're also going to talk about how parathyroid hormone can influence the kidneys or influence the intestines allowing us to reabsorb more calcium from our food and drink. But for the sake of our discussion today, parathyroid hormone spit out when I don't have enough calcium causes my bone tissue to release some of the calcium that it had back into the bloodstream, getting my blood calcium back to normal. On the opposite end of the spectrum, if I have too much calcium in my bloodstream, I'm going to use the hormone calcitonin. Calcitonin is kind of the opposite of parathyroid hormone. Opposite number one is instead of being made by the parathyroid glands, the little spots, it's actually made by the thyroid gland, the big one. 
and parathyroid or excuse me calcitonin made by the thyroid gland has the opposite effect on my osteoclasts instead of telling my osteoclasts to work more quickly calcitonin tells them to slow down now the way this helps me to ultimately decrease my blood calcium the best way to think about this is when you're at work there's probably this one person that you work with every time they come into work they are not very active they don't do their job very well and it makes it look like you are the best worker in the world this is what's going on here when I slow down my osteoclasts. If my bone breakers are working more slowly, but my bone builders, my osteoblasts, are doing their normal level of activity, over time, the builders are pulling so much calcium out of the bloodstream that the breakers aren't replacing, we end up lowering that blood calcium. So the first set of hormones that alters the process of, of blood calcium homeostasis, parathyroid hormone, and calcitonin. Notice on this slide that we have this, this balance shown here. Half of my table has been filled in. Let's fill in the other half together. We talked about how the parathyroid glands spit out parathyroid hormone. They do this when we have a low level of calcium in the blood. Parathyroid hormone talks to my osteoclasts and it tells them to increase their activity. They need to degrade bone tissue. As they degrade bone tissue, we get back to normal. But what are we going to do if blood calcium gets too high? That's what we see on this side of, of the axis. When blood calcium gets too high, this is something that my thyroid gland is going to respond to. So when blood calcium gets too high, the thyroid gland gets activated. And when the thyroid gland is activated, it spits out calcitonin. So the hormone released is calcitonin, released by the thyroid gland. The job of calcitonin is to slow down my osteoclasts. As I slow them down, the level of calcium that's in my bloodstream starts to go back down because my bone builders are, are pulling all of that calcium out of the bloodstream. So two different ways to look at the role of parathyroid hormone and calcitonin in the process of bone remodeling. Whether you like this image or this image better, doesn't matter. Just make sure we know which hormone is released by which gland and what does it do to blood calcium. The other kind of hormones that regulate the process of bone remodeling are growth hormone and the thyroid hormones. Growth hormone and thyroid hormone work together when you're building your bone tissue for the first time. So growth hormone, unsurprisingly, helps your body to grow. As we release growth hormone, we pair its activities with the two thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, making sure that as your bones grow, they grow in the correct proportions. And in males, we also see an impact of the hormone testosterone on the process of growth. Testosterone uh, is going to enable this male growth spurt that we typically see around the time of puberty, when testosterone starts to be made. So growth hormone, and thyroid hormones involved both in male and female growth. Testosterone, the reason why typically males tend to be a little bit taller than females. One last factor to mention that alters the process of bone remodeling, and this is what we call mechanical stress. All mechanical stress is, is putting pressure on your bone tissue. So two of the big sources of pressure on your bone tissue our gravity, the fact that we live on Earth, as well as the movements that your body does. When our body is moving, or as gravity is pulling on, on our body, this leads to some specific changes in the structure of our bone tissue. So there's this thing in science called Wolf's Law that helps us to understand 
the ways that our bones are remodeled in response to this strain. So one of the things that Wolf's Law predicts for us is that the thickest part of our long bones are in the very middle of the diaphysis, in the shaft of the bone. If we consider the way that compress compression works on our bone tissue, when I have the, the place that I'm going to feel the most stress is in the middle, by reinforcing the bone tissue there, I can more equally uh, transition that stress from the top and the bottom, it's shared. We also see that depending on whether you're right-handed or left-handed, that will, will dictate whether your radius and ulna are thicker on the left side or the right side. By putting more stress on those bones, by using them, it changes the thickness of your bones. We also see on our bones, those bone markings that you learned for, for lecture and you're learning for lab, those bone markings have developed because muscles attach to various places on the bones. So all of these large projections that I see here are projections that have developed over time through the evolution of our bone tissue to the kinds of stress that we're putting on it. I'll also mention that for some of those bones uh, that get a lot of stress, like the femur, the tibia, and the fibula, we're also going to curve them or strengthen them to prevent breaking in those places.